So we're just out in this glorious weather for our state mandated exercise and I just wanted to talk about this video that I've uh, done recently with my good friend Ben Bowers and Toby Kent. Toby I went to school with randomly years and years ago in Seven Oaks and, and Ben I've done a lot of work with through DGR in November but we explore what is resilience and the resilience ecosystem. You know, all of the, all of us have a different perspective, a slightly different perspective on resilience based on whether we've worked in corporate life or whether we've gone through personal challenges and are helping others. And also uh, in Toby's case, where he's been supporting communities and and uh, and, and cities and, and, um, and other sort of urban environments and helping them build resilience. It's a long video. We got quite carried away and quite passionate about it, but I hope you enjoy it. It might be one to listen to rather than maybe, uh, I guess, watch, but it's, uh, it's quite an interesting discussion we had and we probably could have gone on for hours and hours and hours. Anyway, I hope you enjoy it. And uh, if uh, we don't get another video out before Christmas, have a great Christmas and a happy new year. So hi everyone, I just wanted to thank you for, for watching this video. And I'm delighted to be joined by Toby Kent and Ben Bowers. And we're gonna explore what resilience actually means to each of us and how that may be joined together in a, a resilience ecosystem, if you like. Uh, I'm Mike Butler and I, I work with corporations looking at corporate resilience and macroeconomic resilience. And I'll let Toby introduce himself, first of all. Um, hi there, uh, as Mike says, I'm Toby Kent. Um, I work with a number of organizations, both in private and public sectors uh, on resilience issues. Uh, and my sort of most recent formal role uh, with that title was Chief Resilience Officer for Metropolitan Melbourne here in Southern Australia. And we, we've noted that uh, we, Ben and I are in the dark, wet UK, uh, just entered tier three for most of the Southeast and you are in sunny Melbourne. And I'm sure we'll, we'll tune into COVID a bit later on and, and how you guys are actually faring a lot better than we are at the moment. Uh, ben. At the moment. Hello, yes, uh, Ben Bowers, um, AKA uh, Penny No Nuts. Um, and uh, I've spent the last sort of 10 years um, in the field of, of men's health and uh, mental health, having been on um, my own sort of personal journey with, uh, with testicular cancer and my, my own mental health. Um, and now I'm a consultant and speaker um, on the subjects. Super. Thank you. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm out qualified by all of you guys and uh, I'm looking forward to this conversation. But uh, Toby, what does resilience mean to you? Yeah, so there are you know, many different definitions of resilience and they all sort of work around a theme. But the one that I particularly like was adopted by the Rockefeller Foundation uh, when it created uh, its network of resilient cities, 100 resilient cities. Um, and the definition goes like this, and if you, I'll, I'll drop the urban bit, because I think uh, the reason I like it is, is it's so scalable and applicable in, in different contexts. And it's that resilience is about the ability um, of organizations, communities, and people within them to adapt, survive, and to thrive in the face of whatever chronic stress and acute shock that they face. And it's really that interplay between the chronic stresses and acute shocks uh, that makes that definition such a valuable uh, and broadly applicable thing. I, I won't go on about it right now too long because I, you know, we want to sort of, this is a conversation for all of us, but quite often, and particularly at the organizational level, there are organizations that deal well with the, sh the, sh the acute shocks, whether that's a cyber attack, a flood in the basement, whatever it may be, but they really fail to deal with chronic stresses, which may be how their staff get to work, commuting, things that slowly over time tear away at the fabric of those things. And of course, when acute shocks do event, it is those entities, be they people or assets that are already in the place um, are most stressed that bear the brunt of that shock most acutely and for longest so anyway, the ability to adapt survive and thrive uh in the face of stresses and shocks is my preferred definition yeah. very good and, and and i guess for me this is the start of why we're having this conversation i thought it really interesting is that thematically your definition i'm sure will become very it's very similar to when i when i have my turn to go through my definition of resilience, and I'm sure we'll we'll connect dots into into Ben as well, and 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 your definition. And Ben, yeah, what what do you think about when you think about resilience? 
it was interesting. I, you know, just just before we came on, I I just went to look up um, the definition. Um, a, bit, a bit like you sort of what what is the definition of resilience, and I guess the one that's most applicable to you. And I came across two. There's probably you know the original um, the scientific definition where the word originates and the ability of a substance or object to spring back into shape. You know, it's elasticity. Yeah. Um, and then the other definition, the capacity to recover quickly from difficulties. Um, I think it's interesting when you, for me, when you start to look into that and the the the, the physics based definition, you know, the ability to to spring back into shape is 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 I think a lot of people talk about resilience in that context, you know, in their understanding of of the word, but. Whereas a, an object has form and structure and rigidity, it's it's predefined, if you like. So its ability to spring back into that shape is is suggesting that shape is the original shape is robust, I guess. Um, whereas I think resilience in people is it, it, making that assumption that that state that you're springing back into is is a good state. And I think yeah, as we'll go into for me. You know, my original sort of personal context of resilience was was um, springing back into a form that was imperfect for for that long term sustainability, if you like, um, and therefore that resilience that I had wasn't particularly effective because I was you know resorting back to a, a less than ideal state. Um, so. I think it, you know, as, as we go into this conversation, maybe it might be interesting to sort of explore your views as well on ensuring, um, I guess, you know, as, as you said, Toby, within a corporate environment, that, you know, that chronic stress, if that's there, it doesn't matter how resilient you are to, to an event, you're not able in the long term to, to, to be you know, sustainably resilient, if you like, um, mm. in that context. So, um, yeah, sort of... It, I open my eyes a little bit to to my own experiences and how I've you know learned to be more resilient through the experiences I've had, but actually to ensure that 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 state I go back to is is a much better one for me, um, mm. which actually makes it easier to be more resilient um, and to bounce back quicker and, and better and not to 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 suffer the adversity as as acutely as as maybe I had done in the past. Yeah. So that's interesting. I mean, the, I, I I actually looked up the definition as well earlier. It would look like an <laughs> well, I'm going to talk about resilience. We don't know what the definition yeah, is. But it, or actually, do we? Or do we? Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it, but it, you know, the, the kind of the the original definition of a of a material's ability to essentially rebound from a deformation into or deformation, deformation or something else, into um, into its original shape is is fascinating because. You know, when I've talked about resilience at work, it's been the resistance to failure. And you kind of have that, right? So it's a resistance to failure rather than if in, in, in some of the old terminology, a business continuity, which is in many senses about recovering from failure and preparing to recover from failure in, in the most successful way. Resilience, in my mind, is, is, is starting to be much more proactive starting to think about how you can build resistance to that failure in the first place. And then if you look at the original definition of that, maybe that's, that's making sure you've got enough rigidity in your material or in yourself or in your organization, or you've got enough flexibility that you can actually deform it without it um, losing its integrity and losing its ability to be able to be that object again, once you've got through that stress. And when you apply that to a, to an organization or, or a corporate you know, I've, I've been talking a lot about having, you know, resilience. Yes, it's having resistance to failure, but if you get resilience right and you can, you know, hashtag fail better, which is something I've been talking about a lot, you can actually survive and thrive and flourish, which is something you talked about, Toby, about thriving, right, through adversity. And if you can actually get yourself in a position where your organization is capable of, of anticipating, proactively responding, remediating, whatever words you want to use to a stress and really any stress. But don't forget that you'll probably need to recover at some point. COVID has taught us that, that no matter how prepared we may think we are for things like pandemic and the UK has historically been one of the best prepared 
countries in the world allegedly for pandemic. And I think we've seen that that's been tested a lot over the last year. You know, you have to be good at recovery as well. But, but you know, before you get there, resilience has got to be resistance to the failure in the first place and being sure that you can survive, thrive and flourish through those events. And when I think about that, at the end of the day, a company or an economy which sits around all of us, um, whether it's the UK or planet Earth, etc., is made up of humans and community and groups of humans. And that's why I thought this is really interesting listening to you guys already so far. We're all talking the same language. Ultimately, we're all talking about the same thing. The object that we're talking about might be an individual or it might be a community or it might be a company or it might be an economy. But at the end of the day, if you narrow that down into its most granular unit, that is a human. And humans and personal resilience allows us to build up into a macroeconomic resilience. So I, I think this is, this is quite an interesting topic in my mind to, to really explore. I don't know if you guys have any other thoughts on that. Yeah. And a quick one, um, just on your talking about re resistance to failure. And I think this is really interesting, um, again, across the kind of the domains that you, you've set up in this conversation, Mike, from the organizational to the personal. But it strikes me that particularly at the personal level, um, there's also an, an important part of kind of what you might call modern resilience practice that is not just about resistance to failure, but that is about embracing failure. Mm. Um, and I think it's uh, the distinction between an ability to test and fail in controlled or anticipated ways. That means the system as a whole doesn't actually, you know, when you think about increasingly what we try to see sort of in, in, in schools, um, certainly in uh, more innovative companies is an ability to try uh, and be willing to fail and adapt quickly on the back of failure. So it doesn't bring the whole thing down. It doesn't mean that if you try something at school and it doesn't work that you're a failure as a student, it means you had a go and you pick yourself up and you move on to the next thing. And you know, that's, if Henry Ford were designing cars today, uh, he certainly wouldn't be going with, you can have any color you like so long as it's black. He would, you know, it would be, well, let's see how quickly we can get something out. It won't be the Model T. Um, but it'll be something and we'll see how people respond and we'll make it fit for the general purpose. Um, and, I, and I think that's, um, in some ways it's a micro point, in other ways it's an important uh, element of detail as we think about resilience. Um, uh, and I don't know, for Ben, as I say, for me, that particularly kind of comes out at the in level of the individual, um, that ability to fail. Yeah, and I think that that scales up quite quickly you know as you as you go through that i think about context in which i i you know see that and and draw inspiration from it and certainly um elements of you know professional sport um and and, and friends friends in the special forces you know hearing them talk about resilience mm -hmm. and you know i think mm -hmm. there's that interesting you know those two elements too as you've you've suggested there's sort of trust in the process you know, your methods, your preparedness um, of how you tackle um, adversity and that resilience that you build up through repetition, through training, through muscle memory, um, you know, and, and trust that when, especially I think about this guys in the special forces, they talk about, you know, when bullets are flying and people are dropping, mm. it would be very easy you know, you're getting bent heavily out of shape. It would be very easy um, to to collapse, to to give in. But because you've trained so hard, because the muscle memory is there, you you should get into that flow where you just trust in your training, and mm -hmm. and there's actually more of a calmness than a panic because you've built the resilience to adapt to that. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, these are extraordinary situations where where that ability to adapt actually having that calmness and that resilience in built gives you that time and space maybe to to make those decisions to adapt and change um as is required um and i think you know as it with rugby teams you know they, they 
they play to the system they they train they have a game plan but if it goes wrong they've got to move on very quickly but it's that that moment to stop and reflect and fail fast to understand mm. where it went wrong identify the issues and then overcome those you know build in that knowledge into how you move forward and you know any high pressure situations i think having that having the the good system the good practice the good resilience methods in place to to ensure that that you're in the best state you can but also also with like you say with that mindfulness that that you may fail and that's not a complete disaster it's just an opportunity to learn and tweak the model further i think i think it's i think this is really interesting because you you've got um <clears throat> in many ways we we are continuing to go through more and more change in our lives and faster and, the pace and faster. Of change is just getting yeah. faster and faster and faster and i know that through the work that that you've done with Movember and you know, that we've done together on some of the, the Distinguished Gentlemen's Ride, that that men, mental health in men in particular, and it, it's not just a, a men's health issue, but is is now the uh, suicide is now the highest cause of death for men in their forties, which is which is horrifying. And while everyone has their own individual reasons for that, one has to think that the pressures of life with the pace of change of life and the pace of change of society and the expectations on an individual contributes towards that. And the lack of time, the perceived lack of time and the real lack of time that people might have. And, and certainly when I look in the corporates and think about change as well, you know, we've gone through a massive technological change over the last 20 years or 30 years from a, relative you know big monolithic platforms that that relatively um complex but when you make changes to them you spend months thinking about it planning it coding it testing it before it hits production nowadays we've broken those all up into lots of mini apps and it's it's made for much more flexible platforms much more flexible technology but it means that we are making thousands of changes potentially a week Whereas before we might make one change every six months. And so that that leads to instability. So instability in technology, instability, or could lead to instability, I should say. Um, Google today had a, a for this is the 14th of December 2020. Google had a 30-minute outage today. All right. Now, what wow. I'm hearing it's a change-related outage they were patching something, some things, and it caused a massive outage to the systems. Now, to be fair to Google, they're still at sort of 99.999% uptime for the rest of for, for the last 12 months. But you know, these they're, they're, no one is, is immune to these, these outages, whether it's a company, whether it's a community, whether it's a, an individual where a change is involved and, and the struggles with that. Yeah, I think that's, you know, Really interesting that the, the pace of change, and you know, if you look back over human history, I'm not quite sure how far human history goes back, but let's say it's twelve thousand years or so, I guess. Yeah, you know, thinking the Chinese were around eight thousand years ago. Um, up until the 1850s, not a lot happened, really. You know, if you think about it, not a lot changed, and it changed very slowly. But then fast forward from the Industrial Revolution mm. onwards, the world's just gone bonkers. And yeah. if you bring that up to modern day, you know, when I was first diagnosed with cancer in 2006, the iPhone hadn't been invented. It was only 14 years ago. You know, Facebook's 17 years old. Yeah. But look at the impact the iPhone has had on society and that pace. And, and look at the impact that technology in that level has had on people's resilience, you know, and people's ability to adapt and the, the speed in which you have to adapt to new things, you Stuff, know, like influences, yeah, yeah. You know, Instagram, you know, the best and the worst thing. Yeah, you know, I remember when it just used to be about pretty pictures, <laughs> you know, and now it's just an absolute, you know, for, for good and bad, it's a, a, a beast. And, 
has huge impact on people and 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 all of this noise all of this pace makes it incredibly hard to you know, to even find a system that works for you to build resilience because the game's changing you know what you mm. knew to be true last year is fundamentally different you know, covid's just a you know a, a huge global example of of what's been happening really for the for the last 20 years anyway and that that pace mm. of change i think is is yeah you know, as you say companies are emerging so quickly they're changing so quickly you just look at the, how companies are pivoting with the working from home at the moment mm. you know all of a sudden the, the way the world operates has changed in a work capacity yeah mm. so what you thought you if you thought you were resilient in a work context before because you went to the office at nine o'clock on a monday morning you did your hours you came home your home life was sorted you had um, separation you had work colleagues you know everything you knew to be true that you were comfortable with that was your coping mechanism to tackle the rest of the adversity that life threw at it it's fundamentally changed yeah so your tools aren't applicable anymore yeah yeah i sometimes refer to um you, you said you don't know how far we go back in human history but um i sometimes say refer to us living in the irony age uh <laughs> and the irony being that there has never been a point in history where we have been better able to map and predict the future. Uh, at the same time uh, that we, uh, and directly correlated, um, we have never had better science or a better understanding of the physics of the world. And yet, we have less idea as individuals and communities as what the future will hold for us, that pace of change you were both talking about. And science has become optional. Um, uh, it's it's it become a massive truth. relief. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so we're, we're living, uh, and I think part of the reason for that goes exactly for, for both of us, uh, or, or, and particularly actually why science has become an optional extra um, is exactly to your points around the pace of change. It is just overwhelming. And I think it is almost a, um, it's a societal reaction to go, this is now outpacing my ability to feel comfortable with this or to know what it means for me. And so my, one of the coping mechanisms is just to say, no, I don't believe in climate change. It's too big it's too threatening and what the hell am I meant to do? And there are people out there who will tell me I don't have to believe it. I'm going to go with them. Um, and, and I think uh, this, is, this is not a scientific thing, but I, my hypothesis would be in part, this is a massive stress response uh, to an inability to deal with some of the rapid changes that we're facing. So is, 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 is this humanity? Like if we go back to that shape Right, we're now humanity is the is the shape in the original definition. Right, are we now? Are we? Are you, what you're saying, Toby, is that humanity's shape is being squeezed and squeezed and squeezed like a stress ball, and there's that thing that's bulging out the side of it, and you're thinking, is that going to pop? Is that is that ready to go now? Is that what you're thinking? That's really interesting. Unfortunately, the way you frame that, Mike, it just made me think. At some point, we're going to have to get to. Um, why Ben introduced himself as Benny No Nuts, which is unfortunate <laughs> in the context of that popping out of the shape. But um, I think perhaps uh, is part of my response. I think the other thing, though, for all of the challenge and adversity that we face as humans, I think, you know, and we, we should acknowledge that resilience is a wonderful quality that we all want to have, even if it's something that none of us, ever, we, we really want to have to demonstrate. Um, you know, again, I something to say, no one wants to tell you how resilient they were on their holiday. Um, so, but we have as humans, and you opened this up, Mike, with a, you know, right at the beginning with a kind of a bit of a reflection on who we are as humanity. As humans, we do have a track record of being for better and for worse, incredibly resilient. And so while there probably are that stress ball analogy may not be a bad one in that when you squeeze it, yes, there are things popping out the side and whatever, but 
it will return to its form. I don't think we're at the beginning of the end of society entirely as we know it, nor um, indeed as the end of humanity. So I think we will, we may morph, uh, you know, we're now getting into the world of, you know, um, you know, where cyborgs of some form are no longer uh, merely science fiction. You know, our ability to upgrade ourselves a part of our reality. Um, so maybe we are bounced back to exactly the shape that we were, but I don't think we are entirely losing that human form or some sort of metaphorical form either. I mean, what, one of the things that um, I was curious of your views on was 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 COVID. And uh, COVID-19 has introduced these various lockdowns across the globe and in different countries and communities. And um, we were particularly worried about the veteran community in, mm -hmm. in the lockdown that would be uh, perhaps, you know, come back and PTSD sufferers or, or, or anyone really that, that has a, uh, a mental health issue that may need support from other people that if they were locked up in their they're, they're flat somewhere by themselves that they weren't going to be able to get mm -hmm. that support. And that was one end of the spectrum. And on the other end of the spectrum, it sort of felt like it was an opportunity for a lot of people to just take a breath in and just sort of go, because <sighs> all of a sudden we weren't having to get on the train every day and, and, and go up to, to London to, to work or wherever it was we want to get to work. We, we had time back and we could suddenly find ourselves mm -hmm. between whatever it is that we do. I mean, I, I spent my day, ironically, m most of my day was kind of like this, but sat in an office, a very expensive office in Canary Wharf, where I was on the phone or on a video conference with people sat at my desk for like 12, 13, 14 hours a day. But, you know, instead of doing that, you, you can sort of hop off in the middle and go and say hello to your kids who were just stuck at home as well, and then go back to your office again, and then do a bit more work and then pop out and have lunch with everyone. And it was that, that reconnection time that gave everyone opportunity to sort of draw a bit of breath and 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 sort of return the shape back to a, a sense of normality and reduce the pressure on it. So you kind of had these two ends of the spectrum, I think, during the during the lockdown. And um, and I think that you know, Ben, you were talking about working from home and how things have changed a lot. And 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 it'd be interesting to get your view on you know, what do you think about that from a personal resilience perspective, from a community view. Do you think that COVID has helped or hindered? people's resilience uh, or is it catalyzed um the opportunity to reflect on 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 some of the tools and coping mechanisms that actually may have helped them through the lockdown that actually might help them now in anything that they do yeah i i, I think so there's there's two two parts to that i think it's you know for those if, for me, speaking personally, through lockdown, you know, I was um, self-employed um, within the last year um, in the public speaking world, events-based. So everything fell apart, you know, revenue, income disappeared. I was in that black hole of government support that I didn't qualify for anything, Um so, you know, it was a, a, a potentially you know, a disastrous situation and, and could have been very bad. I've been through worse. Mm. Um, I mean, that was pretty, I mean, 2020 has been pretty close to the worst year ever, but, but having cancer and chemo kind of trumps it, um, to be fair. <laughs> but, and I've got through that. So, so I was... I've learned through through those you know that adversity I've been through to 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 be incredibly resilient, and I think that's something I've I've built up all through my life through through my childhood and beyond. Um, and the cancer was the cancer was actually the the time afterwards um, when when I was you know very um, unwell mentally with depression, anxiety, undiagnosed, um, and and wasn't aware of of sort of my own mental health that I went on that you know, journey of discovery to, to start to work all of that out and, and what worked for me. And that, that was what gave me the tools and the equipment, that opportunity to, to stop, reflect and, and, and build my, my toolkit of, um, of resilience. 
that meant when we got to this year and the shit hit the fan, I coped and I coped really well. You know, I could deal with it. I could process it. I could talk about it. I could look after myself. I could take, you know, the necessary steps to ensure that, that I didn't just survive through, through this pandemic, but, but I did whatever I could to thrive through it and come out the other side, you know, stronger and faster and in a, in a good position because I'd already learned those lessons. I think you know, for those people that, that have already learned those lessons, they, they you know, probably found it you know, an easier journey to cope with lockdown and, and all the stress and the anxiety that, that went along with it. And those that hadn't would have really struggled. Yeah. I think to, to your second point, I think I've alluded it to already, you know, for a lot of people now, I think there's, there's a, a wonderful opportunity. We, and we've already seen it, you know, the, the conversations, awareness, discussions around mental health now um, on an individual level, on a, on a, on a work-based level, on an institutional and international level has gone through the roof. You know, it's conversations we were starting to have, but I think the opportunity is, is like never before in history for, for us to really um, have some impactful um, discussions and, and, and impactful um, movements to, to improve people's mental health. And it has given everybody that opportunity to stop and, and, and reflect. Now, some people won't have taken that opportunity um, because if they were like me in their 20s, they weren't aware um, of, of any of this and the importance of it. Um, but I think as a, as a moment in time, this will go down in history. You know, I, was, I was talking to someone today about, about the impact. So it's never before has something happened that has affected every single person on the planet acutely. Yeah. You know, climate, like we're talking about climate change. It's too big a idea for most people to get their heads around, so they just ignore it. Don't deal with it. Not bothered. Financial crises happens to bankers. Guy in the Western Isles isn't really bothered, doesn't affect him day to day. This has affected everyone, and they, you can't get away from it. And that is a, a profound moment and and creates that pause that gap now to be filled with this messaging around around resilience around mental well-being around um the world in general and how we live our lives and how we conduct ourselves and and you know we're human so we probably won't take as you said toby you know we probably won't take the opportunity um as, as maybe we should and history will show we we thought about it for five minutes and then just reverted back to back to normal and destroyed the planet again but you know now is the moment and, and we need to do everything we can really to capitalize on that and, and that pause now to build resilience will be so important yeah forward mm. uh, and i think you know you, you touched on it ben but again the, the reality is that we will some people will really have benefited from this moment and for others you know, there won't have even been a chance to reflect um, because actually um, whether they're you know, stuck at home with abusive partners, um, whether they're actually they're having to work even harder in their two or three jobs uh, to try to maintain any form of income uh, means, you know, I, I think actually part of the challenge um, both of COVID and coming out of COVID um, is the disparity. And, you know, going back to that sort of stress, the chronic stress and acute shock framing uh, again, there will be what catastrophic events of any variety tend to do is to further entrench uh, advantage and disadvantage. Um, and so I think, you know, uh, in the same kind of way that actually the very wealthiest got even wealthier coming out of the global financial crisis because they were able to take advantage of cheap assets, uh, reinvest and so forth. We've seen the same thing now where actually the, the richest 1% have once again got even richer. And one of the challenges for the world at the moment is um, I'm taking like the Millennium Development Goals and talk about the billions who've been lifted out of poverty since 2000, which is on one level an amazing achievement. But actually within that, there is a massive ignoring of nuance or context, uh, which is, A, you still have almost 2 million people without access to sanitation uh, in a world in which some people are, you know, uh, anyway, in, in a world in which there is a relative greater wealth. But 
taking it too far down that, I, I just sort of wanted to, to reflect on, um, on those disparities. But I think the other thing is that um, we're talking about the COVID crisis in the middle of the crisis. And the reality is um, we don't know whether we're at the beginning of the end or the end of the beginning. Uh, and I think, you know, Chairman Mao doesn't normally get spoken about a lot in uh, positive uh, discussions of resilience. But he was asked uh, by French ambassadors his views on, on the revolution. And he said in the 1920s was too early to tell. But he'd been asked about the French Revolution. Now, I'm not suggesting we need uh, 150 years before we know what the impacts have been. But certainly, I think three or five years before we have any idea of what was the right approach, we don't yet know whether what we did here in Australia uh, and in Victoria in particular to go really hard on, on the lockdown being here, where we're on 43 case days of zero community cases, zero deaths. And it's easy to feel pretty pleased with that. Um, strong investment by everybody leading to a great return for everyone. We don't yet know how this disease may evolve, how it will roll out. If we don't actually vaccinate, again, back to that uh, advantage and disadvantage, if we do not get a vaccine to everybody uh, around the world, to your point, Ben, this is a, 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 an a global problem of, of unparalleled proportions in so many ways. So we don't know how that will evolve, but here in Australia, we're now looking at a situation where we will probably lose more people to suicide because of the economic consequences and the very harsh lockdown than we will do um, from the actual disease. So we live in an incredibly complex um, world. And, and yeah, I, I think it'll just be I guess my hope would be, again, coming back to your points, is that there is enough opportunity for enough people to seize on you know, uh, awareness of mental health, um, an opportunity to do some things better. Um, I, as a British Australian, um, without taking this down a political route, spend a lot of my time feeling utter despair that it feels like when I left the country, the country that I left a dozen years ago has somehow been stolen from me. Um, but actually some of the things that the British government is doing to put in place a green recovery, uh, green led recovery and so forth is actually quite uplifting uh, if, if they can deliver on that. Mm. Um, I'm not even sure it's been declared as oven ready, but anyway, we'll, uh, We'll see how it goes. That's probably a conversation for another day as we go into <laughs> that. I, I think it's interesting that, you know, so, we, so so kind of my two extremes have turned into different granularities in there, but the, the extreme of the individuals starting to really struggle with their own mental health because of the government's response or the government's response in many cases to um to help save lives from this virus ironically is shifting the balance somewhere else now and and it, it strikes me then ben I, i'm really interested in your view as to you know what can people do i mean what, you you've been through this this journey and maybe you could go into a little bit more detail of the the journey you've been on and how that helped you in 2020 but what can other people do to to start to build that resistance to failure in their individuals as an, as an individual. Yeah. I think it's a really good point. I think we have to be very careful um, when we start to, to, to analyze this, you know, in the years down the line and just sort of a point to, to the listeners with, with things when we talk about suicide rates and the impact that that's had, we won't know that mm. for, for six to 12 months, it, purely because of the way that suicides are reported. Mm. Um, and the data is released. You know, it, it's we won't know it for probably a year, realistically, to what the suicide rate actually was through through the pandemic. So, any reports now talking about it are, are false and they're inaccurate because because we just don't know yet. And there's a strong suspicion that it's going to go up, and I think it's probably fair to say. But but um, in terms of being um, accurate um, and representing this stuff properly, sorry, Toby, was that something yeah, you just wanted to add? There, uh, sorry, I, I was trying to take advantage of a um, what from this end was a, a, 
uh, I'm breaking the connection to jump in, but, uh, and the nature of trauma, um, as you know, uh, I might expand on Ben, but means that it's not something that ends within a year. Uh, and so what has been triggered in 2020 may not manifest in for another five, six years, but that, that, and we, that will never be captured as a cause of, of, of COVID. But that doesn't yeah. mean that actually the impacts uh, on people. But anyway, sorry, I'm yeah. interrupting. No, you're absolutely right. And there's a lot we, we won't know. I think what we need, to, so we, we, one of the things we need to be careful about is where we, where we apportion blame um, in this. And, and the government... You know, for, for for right and wrong, and and there, realistically, there was no right and wrong at the time. It was just decisions had to be made based on hopefully the right information and, and by people that were inexperienced in dealing with these situations, as the whole globe was. Right. So, you know, it was just somebody was in the chair and somebody had to make a decision, and it just so happened to be those people at the time. Um, and and you can't really, you know, blame them on too many levels for that. Um, I think when when we talk about mental health and the resilience of, of the people to cope with with whatever decisions were made right or wrong that's that's the real point that we need to address and and ensure that in the future you know we are bringing up the next generation of, of young people in a way that inherently builds in the right resilience the, the resilience they need that brings in the right values the, the morals you know the moral fiber of of the world to ensure that that everybody has the tools that they need mm. when facing adversity whether it's a global pandemic or somebody being horrible to them in the street right mm. um, for me i was never given that education i, I learned it the hard way um as I said, you know, I was diagnosed with, with testicular cancer when I was 25 for the first time. And then again, when I was 30, I had a, a recurrence. Um, I lost a testicle on both occasions. Um, and, and, and the second time around, um, I had uh, chemotherapy for four months as well because it, it had spread. So, you know, a, a life-threatening illness in my 20s and, and a physical, um, the physical impact, you know, of having something, you know, as a man you know, that you would you know, define yourself um, you know, a lot of men will try and define themselves by the size of their bollocks, um, which is ridiculous. Um, but, you know, I was indestructible. I was uh, um, naive um, to my mental health. Um, I was competitive and took everything head on. And, and I didn't acknowledge, I didn't acknowledge what had happened to me in many respects. I was killed quite quickly the first time around, essentially within a couple of weeks. Um, because I took action, uncharacteristically took action about my health quickly, which saved my life. But but all the other impact of it, I would just you know just ignored um, and and com com compartmentalized. I can never say that. Um, so I didn't address how it had made me feel. I didn't really process what had happened to me. I just I was depressed for a year and, and was quite happy. Um, in that malaise, you know, without without even acknowledging that I was depressed, you know, I was just in it um, and and wasn't working on on myself at all or looking after myself. Um, and I didn't really the second time round again with with a lot going on, but I had to really get help and really start to go through that that journey. Um, once I finally accepted that I did have mental health struggles i wasn't really myself and i wasn't really coping at all i had to go and get the help um and to my frust my initial frustration when i first went to get help i sat in a counselor's room and sort of started to open up about how i was feeling expecting the counselor then to tell me what to do i'm thinking right fix me like you would with a doctor this is the problem mm -hmm. what do i need you know fix me and and I had to go on, you know, a long uh, a period of, of understanding that, that they weren't going to fix me. I had to fix myself. And that all came down to starting to really understand me, understand how I operate, understand my triggers, understand how I process things and, and learn from there. Once I've been through that period of reflection, if you like, um, 
self-assessment. Um, yeah, it was pretty scathing report came back on me um, from myself. Um, but that level of honesty to take the time to stop and reflect and think and, and be introverted in, in yourself, um, I could then work out me and what makes me tick. And by doing that, I could then learn what tools I needed that were, were useful for me on an individual level to build resilience, to, to be able to cope when things are, are challenging, to identify when I'm descending into period of depression, you know, if something's, if I'm getting too anxious or something's getting a bit too much or I'm getting too manic, saying yes to too many things without thinking about the repercussions of, of what those are. I had to learn that for me and, and find those tools for me. And I think that is, for, you know, this is, you know, what, what I talk about to, to corporates and, and everyone, the, the, as we were referring back to, you know, the amount of technology out there that's solving the world's problems and the people peddling apps that are you know going to sort your your well-being out you know download this app and your company will be better um be more resilient all your staff will be happier and that's just absolute codswallop because you just don't know people are individuals and unless the starting point is everyone to stop and this is why now is such a great time right to stop and actually look at themselves and until you understand you, you don't know what's going to work for you. And, and my analogy, you know, it's a sporting analogy. Yeah. Some people are marathon runners. Some people are sprinters. But until you understand how your body reacts to training and, and whether you've got fast twitch or endurance, you know, there's no point you saying Bolt trying to do marathon training to win the 100 meter sprint. It won't work for him. Same for Mo Farah. If he tries to do strength and endurance to, to run marathons, it's not going to help him. And it's the same for your mental health. You know, one tool for one person might work and it won't work for the next person. But until you understand your body and your mind together, you can't understand what tools are going to work for you. And that takes time and it takes reflection and it takes space. Um, and then now people have that. But you need to be helped with that. It's not, I think... You know, you need to be guided through that in a way that is effective for you. Once you've worked that out, you can go and, you know, if guided meditation is the thing that gets you through the day and helps you thrive, brilliant. Um, if it's running, great. You know, whatever it is, doesn't matter. There's, you know, somebody's got an app out there for you, um, but, and you can go and find it, but you need to know what you're looking for. And that for me is, that's how you build the resilience. You, know, you, you put in the practice, you understand the machine, um, how the machine works, how the machine reacts. Uh, and I think that, you know, scales up. Obviously, on your level, Toby, that gets a lot more complicated when your machine is, you know, millions of people and infrastructure and services. Um, but if, if that fundamental understanding how the machine works and reacts, then you can build that resilience and ensure, you know, that chronic stress is removed because the machine's singing and then it can react to those, those crisis points more effectively and bounce back to a much stronger form in the first place. So I'm interested. I, I think um, it's, it's a really good point that if I kind of distill down what you said around everyone's an individual, so there's no one size fits all app to solve uh, mental health issues or bring an in personal resilience to an individual. You can't just say, here's your personal resilience app. There is an app. It's called turning your phone off. Yes, that's a good point. Um, <laughs> but well, it's just, which, is, which works for you. But it might not work for other people. Well, it's just but a start. Uh, it removes the distraction at least. Yeah. But I think that the, the first step is, is, as you say, is that moment to reflect. Kind of give yourself the space to say, I, I'm not well. I need to do something about it. What should I do? Uh, to be honest, Mike, it's not even that. It, it's mm. it's it's a step before that to say to stop and reflect and acknowledge I have mental health mm. and things affect it. Um, yeah. And you don't have to have you know. I speak to other people and they say, "Well, I don't think I've ever had bad mental health. I've always been happy, positive, and they're like great. Okay. That's awesome. You've still got mental health. You're yeah. just in the good bracket, and you, you manage to maintain." 
good about in health. Like some people never get sick, right? It's like, well, it doesn't mean you're not, don't have health, but it's that acknowledgement and understanding of your mental health, yeah. where it's at and what it is. It doesn't have to be a problem necessarily, but, but. Yeah. And, and I think it's interesting because my, my uh, youngest son, well, both my sons um, actually been to the same school. And so, but certainly my youngest one, as he's gone through, <clears throat> they've been, they've taught mindfulness, they're taught personal resilience. He, his homework last week was on growth mindset. You know, he's nine, right? So it, it's the sort of stuff that as a- to go back to school. In the, in the corporate, yeah, right? And I think this is it. They go, they go and meditate in the yurt uh, sometimes, right? And it's just an interesting difference to schooling when I was growing up, or I'm sure when all of us growing up. I know Toby, because we went to the same school. Um, but it was, um, it was inter it's interesting though, to see that I do think that they're, they are being better prepared for life than certainly we were. And so there's a generation, hopefully, that will all become um, stronger and all will, will feel, um, will recognize that there is mental health and that there may be bad mental health and they need to address it and there, there's good mental health and they need to celebrate it. And I think that that's certainly something that that, um, that will help, but it's, that, it's, it's all of us, right? All the people that haven't had that need to go through that and and there's a you know there's a there's a couple of people now who are looking at mental health gyms and 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 should we have you have an annual phys physical certainly when you get over a certain age you might have an annual physical why don't you have an annual mental health checkup at the same time you know there should be something that's embedded into society and into the into our kind of the way that we do things that makes us stop and think and check whether we're okay because it is another part of being healthy at the end of the day and if you're not healthy you need to do something about it yeah yeah toby what, what, what are you what are you taking from this and particularly I thinking wonder... about communities and maybe community leaders what 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 should they do to maybe help their communities be resilient i mean it's very interesting in that um so we know uh through well increasingly well-established empirical research, um, social, re social, social science research by the likes of Professor Daniel Aldrich, who's at Northeastern University in the US, who's studied um, the impacts of catastrophic events, and the correlation between the amount of community connection before an event and how quickly they can recover from, say, uh, for example, Fukushima, uh, and, and the surrounding area in Japan uh, is an area where Daniel's worked a lot. Um, and, and what I'm just wondering is, uh, I'm, I'm going to try, you know, take a, a small conversational risk and try to tie together a few things that we've been discussing. So, um, asked, um, a little while ago, you know, this, the challenge of the speed of change. Um, and we've then uh, been talking about mental health, which prompted your question. And, you know, I wonder if part of what we're dealing with is also, we have not really managed to replace the community of kind of the village and smaller places, you know, going right back, I think Ben opened uh, with the uh, 1850, 1750s and the industrial revolution. And so we do live in places, or many of us, uh, where we have lost that community connection. And I wonder, to your point, Mike, you know, in a sense, listen, I mean, you know, we shouldn't be too rosy eyed about this. You know, these were the same communities that a hundred years, a couple of hundred years before were burning people from the community for being witches and so forth. So communities aren't always lovely. Um, but in other ways, that more tight-knit community where you had intergenerations uh, or intergenerational families did a lot of that check. They would know if you were out of sorts. Um, as I say, perhaps in some cases, I would imagine some form of mindfulness in a yurt would have been encouraged. And in other places, some of their remedies might have been pretty horrific. Um, <laughs> but anywhere I'm going with this now slightly uh, rambling response is um, I think the importance in all this uh, one of the is that connection to others 
Um, and that doesn't mean that, you know, to Ben's point, we're all individuals. For some people, part of a coping mechanism may at times be to remove oneself and seek isolation. But I think in the great majority of cases, even if that is a mechanism at one point in time or one of the ways that somebody thrives, to know that you're going back to some form of community, be that digitally based, um, be it a family unit, whatever it is, but I think we are we struggle to not have a place to emotionally locate. Yeah, it's interesting with um, with, the, with if I kind of talk a bit about the, the corporate side of things and part of what all companies have done at the beginning of lockdown or, or pretty much every company I'm aware of right, is get their Microsoft Teams rollout complete and get a lot of their collaboration tools out to their their staff and their colleagues to try and enable that that digital community and that collaboration and all of a sudden things that were too difficult to get done in companies all got done overnight. So some real Herculean efforts by, by these uh, technology teams to get Skype on every desktop, to get teams on every desktop, to get, you know, zoom stood up and WebEx for everyone and webcams out to everyone and laptops for everyone. So all of a sudden, if we look at where we are today in, in most corporations, everyone has now the ability to work anywhere on the planet, but still feel, part of a community and and there definitely is a risk as a, at a company level that that had you not done that that your staff would obviously be disconnected and if they were naturally introverted and weren't essentially forced by their management every now and again to connect back into a uh, a team meeting of sorts that they would get more disjointed from the organization but it's, it's really helped. But I do think that as a species, we, we, have to, we have to actually be in close proximity to other humans to truly connect. And digital is replaced a lot. Like, this is great being able to, to see you, you know, Surrey and Melbourne and Kent, right? So it's great to kind of have that, that, that connection now, but, but it'd be even better if we were sat even two meters apart Right in in actually hopefully in, in your back garden, Toby, because it's sunny and warm there. But but it's you know it'd be even better to have that that connection. So what's going to be challenging, I think, as we come out of this, and again, you know, we're not we're not through COVID. We've got a lot more to to learn from it. Is what does the workplace look like in the future? Is it going to go back the way it was? I don't think so. But is it going to be? everyone working from home. I don't think it can be either. I think we need to have some blend that allows us to have the flexibility to connect with our communities at home, right? In, 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 the, in the real world, but also connect with our communities at work and do it in a way that allows that, that sort of intimacy. And I don't mean in a, in a sort of romantic sense, but, you know, actually generally exchanging, um, some sort of personal information, data, et cetera, pheromones, whatever it is, so that we actually build stronger bonds with our, our work colleagues and become more motivated and more effective. And so we, I don't think anyone's got the answer to that yet. Maybe it's a, a, you know, a, day, a day in the office for, um, per week or whatever it is, right? But there's certainly something that's going to have to be put back in place when we've got the ability to do that to ensure that we don't lose that sense of community in the workspace. Uh, and, and perhaps one of the one of the one of the outcomes of, of COVID for companies like you know large banks and consultancy firms, etc., is that the we, perhaps we become more aware of the necessity to maintain a community within the organisation. And some companies have known this for a long time and have been very successful because of that. Some perhaps have focused more on outputs than the people doing the work and the inputs uh, and I think that will probably help a lot more but um, I'm conscious of the time as well and, I, and I'd be really interested to get your thoughts in a minute on you know what would you tell someone in a similar situation about how you would build personal resilience and maybe community city etc resilience and I'll, and I'll sort of start off and, and talk about an organization's resilience and, and from my mind it's 
it's that that expect the unexpected type thing that we we talked about be resistant to failure think about what could happen what might happen think about what else you could do as an organization to survive and thrive and flourish through adversity uh, proactively rather than after it's happened and scrambling if you can do that and you've got the teams around you to be able to support uh, your your transformation in that sense then you will succeed as an organization if you can do that and you continue to deliver the product that's required at that time for your consumers you will thrive as an organization and i think that that to me is is the key thing and that's not easy to do if you understand how you do business if you understand what else you could do in these types of situations and you understand how your the, the Lego building block blocks of how your organization's put together and who put them there. Um, actually, that knowledge is something a lot of organizations don't have. Having that and then running through scenarios will actually make an organization much, much stronger and much more ready for uh, something like this to happen again or, or any sort of adversity, whether it's the you know energy shortages coming out of uh, the increasing demands of technology or or, or reduction in in, um, in cold burning fire stations that may require us to, to switch certain things off, etc. There's a lot of things that are coming down the pipe that will challenge us. Um, I don't know what your thoughts are, Ben, on, on how you would put that into action from a personal level. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting. Actually, on that uh, corporate, just, just very quickly, it's sort of something sprung to mind, just some examples and about corporate success and if you look at companies like Peugeot, you know, everyone knows them as the car company, but they're probably one of the most resilient businesses, you know, in history because they've done everything. You know, they built bikes before they made cars. Mm. I can't even remember what they built before that. It was like iron railings or something, but each time they've Pipe gone through, or something. yeah, through a period of adversity, mm. they've, you know, they've been up there as the best in what, whatever they've done they've been top of the market doing it. Mm. But when they've met serious adversity and challenge, they've not had the fear to, to change, to pivot, mm. to, to find a new path forward, you know, confident in what they do, the work they've done, confident in, in the operation they have, but with a flexibility and a, and a confidence to, to completely change the business yeah. you know, overnight. Ducati is another one. Ducati started making um, radios mm. um, with Marconi, in fact, in Italy. Then they went into um, making bicycles during the war for the war effort. Um, and then coming out of the war, they stuck engines in and they make motorcycles now. So there's a company that's fundamentally changed its operating model twice in its history, but has been at the top of the market doing it. So on a personal level, you know, what that means to me is, you know, do the work on yourself, get yourself in a good place, um, be confident in that and your ability to, to tackle adversity, but also to keep that open mind that, that if something horrific happens, see opportunity in that, a chance to change, a chance to pivot, to try something, to be bold, to be fearless in that. And, because you've already built the tools you need, even if it doesn't work out, you'll probably be okay. You'll get through it. You'll find another way because you have that inherent resilience built into your, um, into yourself. Um, so you can take the risks confident that, that you will bounce back. Um, even if you have failure, um, in them, that can be work based. It can be relationship based. It can be anything, you know, it can be hobbies. Um, but that f not having the fear of failure, um, being able to adapt to those failures quickly and then move on, you know, and, and go back to that, you know, the bold person you were when you set off on that path rather than get stuck as the broken person at the end of it. Um, for me, that's, that's kind of how I approach, approach that on a personal level. Great. Thank you, Toby. Yeah, I, I'm wondering as I listen to you both um, whether there's um, a certain thing around purpose. I mean, if Peugeot had said, 
well, our purpose is to make bicycles, um, you know, th then the evolution may not have happened. Um, and I just wonder if there's something in that as well, if it is easier for people to their purpose um, to, uh, to focus on that and to um, understand that when bad things happen, it is not necessarily um, an assault on them as a human, um, but it is a, uh, an unfortunate consequence and they can then uh, get back to their purpose. And their purpose may be, you know, I was listening as you, as you spoke, man, uh, I don't mean this in a critical way, but there was, because of your own success in conquering challenge, your positioning around boldness and determination is not everyone has necessarily feels bold, but they may feel that they can have a purpose, which isn't necessarily bold. But if they know where they sit and what they are there for, where they sit in society or in their family or in, in their network. So that's, that was just struck me as I was listening. And I, I think one of the things, Mike, that is a bit different about a company to society, an urban environment more broadly uh, is the ability to uh, to instruct mm. so um, it is sometimes easier in a company to say you know this is a strategic decision you will now work on this for the good of our bottom line or whatever it may be where that breaks down is the reality is any change or efforts to build resilience will, of course, be most successful when you bring people with you. Um, and so that, um, and where I'm with this is a lot of the work that we've tried to do is really about identifying multiple benefits. So actually, people struggle. If you tell them, you really need to start working now to be prepared for an unknown un event at some no unknown time. Um, a, there's the rational point. I'm, why would I worry about that when I'm worried about putting food on the table tomorrow? And B, there's the overwhelming point, like where do I start and why? But if you take a look at things that you can position as desirable, that better equip you, I think that's a, a really good opportunity. So, you know, at the personal level, encouraging people to get healthy, and I'm oh, sorry, to, no, that's encouraging people to get active in ways that are manageable. So, you know, the, the five minute walk, the 10 minute walk. And so one of the, some of the things we did in Melbourne, uh, creating a metropolitan wide urban forest. And one of the reasons for doing that is actually people are much more likely to take active exercise if, um, if they have access to green space. We also know that access to green space has um, very good um, mental health benefits. So we did that to address chronic stresses uh, around physical and mental health, but it was also there to reduce the heat island effect uh, in extreme heat. Um, the central city is about six degrees cooler where there is decent to where there isn't. And we know that where we have decent vegetation, it can reduce stormwater runoff uh, and flooding. But had we gone out and said, we need to build a whole set of new mechanisms to try to tackle the, you know, the heat challenge and the flooding. And so people would have kind of said, well, that's government's job or um, whatever. What are you wasting my taxes on now? But actually by going out and going, would you like to live in a leafier, greener place? There was not a lot of debate around that. You know, mm. um, it comes with some challenges. You know, it's not straightforward. Um, Eighty is probably not so keen, but yeah. Um, so again, like any anything worth doing, there is complexity to it. But I, I think um, it's really important that we try to, particularly in was as it were moments of peace uh that we try to get people to prepare for bad things by focusing on things otherwise it's just scary and people run away that's a that's a really good point uh, uh i love that because i think we we definitely in the corporate space we prepare for bad things 
by talking about the bad things and scaring the hell out of people going through all the bad things that could happen and let's make sure we're prepared to deal with all those bad things but actually there is a way of communicating that which is not sort of dressing it up as a positive thing but actually uh connecting with people probably at a, at a more visceral level where you, you don't you know you, you're talking to their their subconscious more than maybe their mm. conscious in that respect and that's that'd be quite quite an interesting challenge for us maybe as a, it needs some organizational psychologists to come in and help us understand how to do that but um but you're right i mean you right. you, you sort of simplified it the the green spaces which is an awesome idea i love that idea um but you know it's particularly i'm fascinated by the six degree uh, benefit to the 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 temperature but but in any case you know taking that all those benefits and you didn't have to worry about trying to sell those benefits you just said green space very simple outcome for the change but the benefit was was in was was multiple and 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 yeah you, you'd lose people in going through all those different benefits when you could just say one thing and it and it sells it. Um, I mean, the, talking of a corporate example, I know you mentioned the time, Mike, but I mean, I remember when I was um, working advising a major um, confectionery company in the UK, and they made a thirty-five million dollar saving, um, uh, operational saving, uh, because they said to their staff. We know a lot of you are really interested in uh, working in a better environment, contributing to environmental outcomes. Um, what are your best ideas? And there's a prize at the end of it. $35 million annual saving. Had they gone out going, we need to cut costs. People mm -hmm. would have been, you know, there'd have been a demotivated workforce. They'd have been worried about uh, jobs and so forth. So again, and that's, that's a real pure resilience. But again, when you focus on the outcome uh, that you want, um and, and it can be quite appealing i mean if we had we can't do this now because of where we are but you know you, you were talking about the rapid rollout of laptops and, and remote working what if uh and you know there are companies like JetBlue, the u.s uh low-cost airline carrier that i think had been done some of this um where you know what if people said we really want you to be able to spend work more flexibly spend more time with your families um We'll still expect you to come into the office a bit. Um, uh, we're really concerned about your well-being. By the way, there's also a chance that at some point something may happen that means that it'll be helpful to the company for you to be able to work remotely. I'm just giving you that. You know, yeah. we can't do that because of where we're at. But again, I think to your point, there would be other things that we can begin to sort of put into play. How do you focus on the positive that we want that actually prepares us for the negative that we want to avoid? Yeah. Yeah. So, so I'm going to try and kind of connect a lot of this together, right? And, and think luck. about the, the, the relationships. And it's, I, I feel a like Jerry deep... Springer moment coming on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'll do that afterwards when you've gone. Um, but, uh, no, you know, it, it, I had a sort of preconception of what that would look like. And it's changed as we've gone through this conversation, which is, which is really good. But, you know, I think that there, there is a connection inevitably between all our resiliences, as we talk about it, and the original definition. And, and if I think about starting with a company or an economy and going down from there and this resilience ecosystem, which Toby, you, you, you came up with that phrase um, when we met uh, previously, but it is, it's really thinking about you know, the That's corporation like and the economy need to be resilient to continue to deliver service and continue to move money around, et cetera, right? And so that, that's fine, right? That's kind of resistance to failure at the end of the day, but they're all made up of humans and they're all made up of communities of humans. And I think that the key thing for us to remember as a company, as a corporation, is that they are humans, right? They are, they are at the end of the day, they, they think the, differently, they act differently, they respond differently to different stimulus, etc. There's no homogenous kind of workforce that's going to deliver the thing to get us a service out to our customers. But if we are very clear on and passionate about purpose, and we are connecting at an emotional level with our communities within the organization and our teams and our individuals to explain why we're doing things and to 
help them help us come on a journey, then we get a resilient company by default. And if you start to focus more on this next generation of resilient humans that are coming out of the education system, certainly in the UK, and I suspect in many other countries now as well, we're growing that culture of personal resilience. We, we start to see communities that care more about each other and are just around each other more because of the initiatives like you've pushed out in Melbourne with green spaces. So people, there's more footfall crossing each other in green space and therefore more social activities. You start to see that resilient culture kind of permeate up from an individual into the culture and then connect into this organization that is looking back down and trying to sort of connect the dots between how do we be resilient and how does the community and the human be resilient. And when that connection happens, we've, we've kind of solved humanity's resilience issues as well. But at a corporate level, you know, we, we now have the cultural stub that's there for us to latch on to, to then have those conversations about well, what if, um, we had a, another COVID, you know, COVID-21 or whatever it may be. And then how do we react to that? And what planning should we do? And how can you help us? And, and I, and I think there's be everyone's at an individual level is better prepared for that. Now that's the people that are growing up now, but for the rest of us, you know, we've talked a lot about the journey you've been on Ben and, uh, and a lot of that kind of acknowledgement that mental health is, just health it's just like everyone else and we we need to focus on that we need to have personal resilience then we need to think about you know how we can help ourselves uh, and then build our own individual tools there there are lots of things out there that say this is the best way of doing things and maybe apps help maybe talking to a therapist helps maybe drugs helps whatever it is right but or exercise or yoga i personally find yoga helps me a lot um you know it's it's those sorts of things that actually we can start to inject back into people into into society into communities to help individuals as well so it's in summary it's really complicated to join the dots but they do kind of connect right and we talk when we're talking about resilience we're really having the same conversation with just looking i may be talking about a critical business process like payments and maybe we're talking about um you know the state of victoria being able to deal with whatever it may be or maybe we're talking about uh, you know, Ben's uh, challenges, but at the same thing, we're ultimately talking about that resistance to failure and the ability to, to survive and thrive and flourish as we go through that. Yeah. I think the, the last thing I'd say, just to, as Toby made the point as well, you know, when we talk about the young generation, they're learning this in schools now we need to remember they're learning this in school environment where they're together in communities face to face shoulder to shoulder and then we're sending them off into a digital workplace yeah and undoing mm. all the good work that we've created yeah you know, i think toby made mm -hmm. the point we uh, fundamentally at our core we are social beings and yeah. that's only changed in the last three years maybe right with technology facilitating online whereas we've got well we'll, we'll look this up and find out how long humanity's been going you can put a little screen at the end of this mike uh, Twelve thousand years whatever but that's a yeah, that's a lot longer where it's probably longer social than that, beings right? you know and, yeah. and getting we've got to where we've got today as the most evolved race on the planet through being socially connected with other people in physical presence and and that's one of the biggest risks that we there's no point building resilience in people if they then never see anyone um because it'd be redundant um so yeah excellent point. excellent point any final thoughts from you toby no i mean i mean only that um i, I think building on ben's point that the um the revolution in digital connection uh is a manifestation of our desire to remain connected uh, in a world where um, we have become often physically separated. Um, you know, you and I grew up uh, very close to each other, Mike, and here I am many thousands of kilometers away. Um, so um, I, I think the, the digital thing, um, the remote connection is in and of itself not bad. Um, but uh, a, uh, as Ben was saying, you know, it can never re truly replace um, that 
uh, the, the in-person. And what Ben also alluded to much earlier was also now we're at a point where the technology is overtaking our social mores and so, and so we're now also seeing um, the negative effects of uh, digitally manifesting in real and perverse uh, negative outcomes uh, uh, for, for individuals and others. So I don't want to end on a, on a bad note. I think what I was actually trying to say is um, even we're, with the, the remoteness of digital connection, it still is really um, uh, a reflection of our profound desire to connect in whatever way we can. Yeah. Fantastic. Well, on that on that point, um, thank you, Ben and Toby, for for joining me for this conversation. I think it's been absolutely fascinating. Hopefully, others will will find it fascinating when they listen to it. Um, and uh, thank you very much for your time. And uh, we'll speak soon. <laughs>